Fusion Mobile, quality e-learning experience on the go. Animal nutrition is a little more complex as, as we do expect than we see it in plants. Plants is basically photosynthesis and all the chemical equations that you've seen above. But in plants, it's a little more detailed, it's a little more complex and that's what we're going to be discussing right now. Okay, now food eaten by animals is divided into different groups. There are basically seven groups or classes of food. Okay, first you have the carbohydrates, the proteins, fats and the fats, the water, mineral salts, vitamins and roughages. All these constitute a balanced diet. Now a balanced diet is simply a diet or a meal that contains all these um, parts of food, all these um, classes of food in adequate amounts. Okay. A yeah, balanced diet is, doesn't mean that you sit down and you take a whole bowl of um, gari or rice or something. No, that's not a balanced diet. It's not the quantity of the food that makes the food balanced, but the quality, what it contains. If it contains all these classes of food in adequate amount, then you say that food is a balanced diet. Carbohydrates, which are the primary source of energy to the body, contain the elements of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen with the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen being 2 to 1 in a molecule. In a molecule of carbohydrate, um, in a molecule of carbohydrates, the ratio of oxygen to um, carbon dioxide, sorry, the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is 2 to 1. Now, carbohydrates occur in three major forms. They can occur as monosaccharides, which are regarded as simple sugars. They can occur as complex sugars, which are oligosaccharides. Or they can occur as polysaccharides, that starch, cellulose, which you see in the plant cell wall, and glycogen. Now, let's take them one after the other. Monosaccharides are found in plants and animals as hexose sugars with the chemical formula C6H12O6. For instance, glucose is a monosaccharide. It's seen in grapes, onions, fructose, and other types of fruits. Oligosaccharides, on the other hand, is a more complex form. It's formed by condensation of two monosaccharide molecules. Okay, when two monosaccharide molecules come together, it forms a disaccharide with the chemical formula C6H22O11. All right. Example of disaccharides are sucrose from sugarcane, banana, pineapple, and lactose from um, melt sugar. Maltose also is a disaccharide. It's formed by two glucose units. Now, polysaccharides are formed by the condensation of a very large number of simple sugar molecules. The polysaccharides have a formula CCH1005 in brackets N, where N is a very large number. An example of polysaccharides, like we said earlier, are starch, cellulose, and glycogen. Now, whether mono or oligosaccharides, these are soluble in water, but polysaccharides are not soluble. So, the hydrolysis of oligo and polysaccharides will yield monosaccharides. So, to test for monosaccharides, like we said earlier, we use the felling solution. There's a felling 1 and felling 2 solution. While to test for disaccharides, we use Benedict solution. Okay? Ah. To test for starch, we use the solution called iodine solution. Now, having discussed carbohydrates as a class of food, and we also may, we should not fail to mention the source of carbohydrates, um, starchy foods like rice, yam, and um, gari, and um, fufu, and all those, those are sources of starch, uh, sources, sources of carbohydrate foods. Now we're going to be talking about the proteins. Proteins are bodybuilding substances, they are essential for renewing of cells and repair of worn out tissues. Okay, when tissues wear out, it's the protein that helps to repair them. Okay, proteins are there to help build your body. Now, they are soluble in dilute acids and alkali, but they are not soluble in water. Please take notes. Proteins are not soluble in water. Now, they coagulate when heated because they are essentially denatured. You, you denature a protein once you heat it. That is why it is not encouraged to fry your egg too much to, uh, to a brown. I think some people prefer uh, egg brown. It's not very good because when you heat the protein at extremes of temperatures, extremes of temperature, the protein gets denatured and loses its value. Alright, so next we want to talk about is the component. What makes up the protein? Protein really uh, actually contains carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and some may have sulfur or phosphorus in addition. Proteins are found in muscles, and the proteins you see in muscles are called myosin. Milk and cheese also have protein in the form of casein and albumin is found in eggs. So these are foods that are rich in protein. 
meat, fish, eggs, milk, all these foods are, are rich in protein. Now, protein are the building block, uh, sorry, the building block of proteins are amino acids, of which there are about 25 different amino acids. Now, they are broken down to proteoses, peptides, and polypeptides in a decreasing order of complexity, which means that the most complex of these are proteoses, followed by peptones and polypeptides. Okay? Now, to test for protein, we use the Purette test. That's very important. Purette test is used to test for protein. Also, we can use Milan test to test for protein. That's another reagent that we can use to test for protein. The next class of food we're we'll talking about are the fats and oils. Okay, fats and oils are also known as lipids. They contain a higher proportion of carbon and hydrogen, but little oxygen. The ratio of hydrogen to oxygen in fats and oils and, and lipids generally is two to one. They are stored in the body as a reserve for energy. Okay, and they are also good sources of insulation. Okay, they help you. Your fat, <coughs> your body fat, is a source of insulation against um, temperature loss okay that means that the thinner you are the more likely for you to catch cold okay because you don't have enough fat to pad and insulate your body now they are insoluble in water but they form stable emulsion with dilute alkali fats are oils are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol before being absorbed into the body they are not absorbed directly no they have to be broken down into smaller molecules called glycerol by which we, uh, they are now absorbed into the body. When Sudan 3 is added to fat and oil, the oil picks up the red coloration. So to test for fat and oil, we use Sudan 3. That's the solution or that's the reagent we use to test for fat and oil. When oil or fat is boiled with osmic acid, a black precipitate is formed. So that means that osmic acid is another reagent we use to test for fat and oil. Next, we're going to talk about vitamins, okay? Vitamins are essential in the body, okay? They are a class of food that are important in chemical processes of the body, the body of organisms, okay? Now, there are different types of vitamins. Vitamins are divided into two major classes. You have the water-soluble and the water-insoluble. Okay, when we say water-soluble, that means such vitamins can dissolve in water. When we say water insoluble, salt vitamins do not dissolve in water, but they can dissolve in liquid medium. Now, example of water soluble vitamins are vitamins B and C. Okay? While examples of water insoluble vitamins, that means fat soluble vitamins, are the vitamins A, D, E, K. So we use the mnemonic ADEC. A, D, E, and K vitamins are lipid soluble, while vitamin B and C are water soluble. It's very important for you to remember that because it's a very regular question in your MCQs. Which of the following is not water soluble? Which of the following is not lipid soluble? Lipid soluble vitamin. Um, the table you're looking at is a table that summarizes the types of vitamins that you have, and then the functions of the vitamins, the sources of the vitamins, and then the deficiencies that may, the, the, the diseases or disease conditions that may arise when such vitamins are not present. Number one, the first one there is the um, vitamin A, okay, vitamin A also called thiamine. Um, the sources include liver, eggs, animal fat, milk, fish, liver oil and all that. Very importantly, green leafy vegetables contain vitamin A. Carrots and palm oil also are good sources of vitamin A. The liver and eggs are good sources of vitamin A as well. And like we said earlier, vitamin A is a fat soluble vitamin, okay, and it is destroyed by sunlight and oxidation. When you have little or no vitamin A in your system, it gives rise to a condition called night blindness, okay? It's an eye disease as a result of lack of vitamin A. Also, people that have um, lack of vitamin A can lose weight very easily and they have reduced resistance to diseases. The next one is vitamin B. Vitamin B actually has different types. There's B1, there's B2, B3, B5 and all those. But we don't want to be going into all those details. But just know that vitamin B generally is seen in yeast, in palm wine, in eggs, tomatoes, granuts and all those. Okay? And like we mentioned earlier, it is a water-soluble vitamin and it is destroyed by alkalis. Now, deficiency of vitamin B gives rise to a condition called beriberi. Vitamin C, 
which is the one that we are all very uh, most common with. We are very conversant with vitamin C. It's in everywhere in your food. You lick an orange, you um, eat fruits generally. Vitamin C is a very common vitamin to us. We see it in fruits, like I mentioned, limes, oranges, lemons, guava, tomatoes, grapefruit, green vegetables, all these contain vitamin C. And vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin. Remember we said all other vitamins are fat-soluble apart from vitamins B and C, which are water-soluble. Now, next we are going um, to talk about okay the, the, the deficiency uh, that may arise when you do not have adequate vitamin C in your system is called scurvy. In, if anybody that has no vitamin C or inadequate vitamin C in his body will come down with disease condition we call scurvy. Vitamin D, the next, is seen in sea fish, feed, uh, liver oil, milk, and in eggs. It's also fat soluble. The deficiency of vitamin D gives rise to rickets. In rickets, the bones are very feeble, they can break easily, you know, they can curve, and all that and all that. So rickets is a condition, is a bone disease that is as a result of deficiency of vitamin D. Vitamin E is seen in liver, is seen in eggs, is seen in vegetable oil, and um, it's a fat soluble vitamin. Okay, if you have a deficiency of vitamin E, especially in males, it can lead to sterility. Okay, sterility that means the inability to procreate, the inability to impregnate a woman and give birth. And then vitamin K is the last one on the table and that's seen in green little vegetables okay it's also a fat soluble vitamin and then remember when we talked about the blood in the circulatory system we said that um, the blood has the ability to clot because of your platelets now the vitamin that helps us in clotting is vitamin k if you do not have adequate vitamin k in your system your blood will not clot properly okay Next, we want to talk about the digestive enzymes. All right, we want to talk about digestive enzymes. Enzymes are organic catalysts secreted by living cells to bring about many biochemical reactions in various metabolic processes. Enzymes are divided into four major groups: digestive enzymes. Now, these are the um, those that act on carbohydrates. They are called amylases. They are seen in your saliva. Okay, salivary amylase is contained in saliva. And that's why we say the digestion of um, carbohydrates um, foods starts in the mouth. The moment you put your food in your mouth, your mouth begins, your salivary glands begin to secrete uh, plenty of saliva to help digest that carbohydrate food. It is the salivary amylase, which is an enzyme contained in the saliva that digests the carbohydrates in your mouth. Okay, digestion of carbohydrates starts in the mouth, not in the stomach, nowhere else. It starts in the mouth where the salivary amylase. Is located now the other enzyme which we see is the protease proteases act on proteins okay there are enzymes that help in digestion of proteins and then for fats and oil the enzyme lipase is the enzyme that acts on fat and oils while for cellulose in heavy in herbivores the enzyme cellulase helps in digestion of cellulose herbivores are all those grass eating animals like the cows and the goats and all that they have the ability to chew the cord. That means they chew and then they regurgitate um, after a while. When they chew and swallow, the food goes into the rumen, which is a, a type of false stomach per se. And then after a while, they bring back the food, they like regurgitate it into their mouth and chew. Now, the cellulose in their system is what helps them to digest the cellulose in the grass they eat. Else, you cannot break it down. If we were to eat grass, we cannot break down the grass because we do not have that cellulose. Cellulose, rather. Now, enzymes need coenzymes to activate them. Okay, enzymes on their own will not do nothing until there is a coenzyme that stimulates them, that motivates them to act. Enzymes will not do nothing. So take note of that. That enzymes need a coenzyme to activate them. Enzymes are proteins. They are soluble in water. They are highly specific. That is to say. Enzymes they pay attention to what they are asked to do. Okay, um, let's take the salivary amylase for instance. Now, the amylase is asked to digest carbohydrates. They are specific; they will only digest carbohydrates. You eat proteinous food, you put meat in your mouth. The amylase will not answer you because they only do what they are asked to do. That's what we mean by enzyme specificity. Okay, they are very specific and they are sensitive to temperatures. Okay, they have a specific temperature range where they act. 
anything outside this temperature range, enzymes will not act, okay? Enzymes are specific and they are sensitive to temperatures. The temperature within which the temperature range within which they act is between 35 to 40, 40 degrees Celsius. But enzymes are also denatured at temperatures at grain 40. That's what we mentioned earlier. You know, we said enzymes are proteins, and we said that high temperatures denature proteins. So that also means that if you have a very high temperature, you're going to denature an enzyme. The optimum temperature for effectiveness of an enzyme is the temperature range of 37 degrees Celsius. Where reaction rate is fastest for most enzymes. Enzymes are sensitive to the degree of acidity or alkalinity, and many bring about reversible reactions. Okay, now I have a table here to summarize everything we've been talking about: the um, different classes of food, the um, enzymes that act on them, and all um, whatnot. So let's go straight to the table. Um, first, we see saliva. It's slightly alkaline. It's secreted by the salivary glands, and um, the site where the saliva, um, or the salivary amylase takes action or carries out its action is in the mouth. Okay, the enzyme specifically is called thialin, and then the substrate the, on which the enzyme acts. That means the substance that the enzyme acts upon is called starch, mainly starch, and what it produces at the end of its action is called maltose. The next is the gastric juice. Gastric juice is produced in the stomach wall and the, the, um, the site of action is the stomach. The enzyme in the gastric juice that helps break down um, the uh, protein is HCl and renin and as well pepsin. Well, HCl is an acid, not an enzyme. The enzymes that do, do the breakdown proper are pepsin and renin, but then they need HCl to facilitate this process. Now, the substrate, that means the substance on which the enzymes will act, the um, protein enzymes will act, are pepsinogen, protein, and carcinogen, okay? And then the products at the end of the day is pepsin, polypeptides, and casein. Take note, carcinogen is very soluble in water, it's the substrate here, while casein is insoluble in water. The same thing, pepsinogen, which is the substrate, is soluble in water. Why pepsin is insoluble in water. Okay, um, the protein as well is soluble in water, while polypeptides are insoluble in water. The bile is alkaline in nature and is produced by the gallbladder, and the site where it takes its effect is in the duodenum. Okay? The enzymes involved here is the bile salts, and the substrates on which the enzyme act are fats. Okay? Now, the products at the end of the day is called chylomicrons or fat droplets. The next is the pancreatic juice, which is also alkaline in nature. It's, as the name implies, it's produced by the pancreas. It carries out its effect in the duodenum. And then the enzymes um, it contains, the enzymes that helps it to do the functions, include the amylopsin, trypsin, peptidases, stiapsin, also called the lipase, and then the nucleases. Okay? Now, the substrate for this enzyme are starch, protein, polypeptides, fats, and nucleic acids. While the products at the end of the day, the products you'll be getting are maltose, polypeptides, amino acids, glycerol, and nucleotides. Okay? Intestinal juice, also called um, sucrose entericus, is secreted by the wall of the intestine. Its um, site of action is the small intestine. Okay, and the substrates are maltase, the, the enzymes rather are the maltase, invertase, enterokinase, erepsin, and nucleotidases. While the substrates it acts on are maltase, sucrose, trypsinogen, peptones, polypeptides, and nucleotides. And the end product you get is glucose, fructose, trypsin, amino acid, and two sugars. Okay? The cecal juice in herbivores are produced in the wall of the cecum and the site of action is the cecum as well. Um, they act on the cellulose and the enzymes they use are the cellulases like we mentioned earlier. The end product being glucose. Okay, now to digestive system. Now in digestive system in man, um, very importantly we should mention that one major factor that helps digestion is the surface area involved. Okay, the larger the surface area, the easier digestion occurs and absorption and all whatnot. Now, what makes the, the surface area of our gut, especially the small intestine, to be larger 
than um, normal or large enough to be able to accommodate for these digestive um, uh, procedures or processes is the presence of structures we call the villi. Okay, the villi are in, in the small intestine in vertebrates, they increase surface area for absorption of digested food materials. The villi are also numerous and thin walled to make it easier for division of digested food across them. The villi are well supplied with blood and lymph lymph vessels for the transportation of absorbed digested food. And finally, the small intestine is long and coiled so as to delay the food inside it and hence ensures maximum absorption of digested food. Fusion Mobile, quality e-learning experience on the go.